interesting historical narrative outlined in four major ages of the economic heroes at the human race. First age being the agricultural age of farmers, the industrial age, factory workers, information age, knowledge workers. And for most, we stop there. Most would say today we're in the knowledge age. He goes a step further, he says, no, no, we're actually beyond that already. We're in the conceptual age. Conceptual age. The conceptual age being the age of creators and enterprises. What he's saying is that it's this fourth stage is where we begin to be, feel that we either are going to succeed or not. And if you put it in the business context, that today this is the business that I run, where I think we are. And he talks about these three points, or these three prevailing trends that we actually have today in business. And I would suggest it's broader than society and than business. He talks about the three A's, abundance, Asia, and automation. So when I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm actually trying to figure out what we're going to do to create a business around certain ideas to create a sustainable business, we actually look at this little filter and say, abundance. Today, customers have way too many choices. Nothing is scarce, at least in the Western world. Have you ever come up with an idea and say, ah, oh, so neat, this thing unique, Google it. Okay. It's probably already on anyway. Okay. Don't want to discourage you, but just the fact is, there's so much out there today, and so many people doing it. When you look at the world in terms of what the world's even educating, I think today there's more engineers being educated per year in India than we actually have engineers in all of Canada. So it's not that we don't have this lack of abundance of people, 
So every product you design, design from the outset, and after his lifetime is over, the product will then continue to live and provide nourishment for something new. Okay? They're not talking about stopping. See, environmental movements would maybe suggest we have to stop a lot of stuff. He said, no, maybe I have to redesign something. Maybe we have to rethink it. We have to use our imagination a little bit differently. How can we continue designing new stuff? And how can we protect the environment? And so he puts out that why don't we do what our environment actually does? Our environment, if you go into a forest, there's a lot of garbage. All of that garbage is actually not garbage, it's actually input to the next cycle. We have taken, decided to take a linear approach to our design of product. Linear being build it, use it, throw it out, maybe even recycle it. His suggestion is that no, let's talk about how we really reuse the initial components of those products and actually think of it as a cyclical disease. And actually, in our beginning of our designs and how we actually design products, we build into that design <coughs> not obsolescence, but it's reuse. That puts a whole new responsibility on designers, on companies, that you don't just sell the product, you own the product. Even though you sell it, you own the product in its entire cycle. Talk a little bit about capitalism. This part that is really, you know, at least in our community, in our society, the thing that is a lot of the drive. And we talk about all the great things of capitalism in terms of how it's really, and it has increased all of our, 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 our lifestyles and our neighborhoods, and many of us. But it hasn't done a good job of being equal to all. It hasn't done a good job of actually protecting the environment. It hasn't done a good job of making sure that we don't have. So, can it improve? So there's another well uh, uh, written fellow, his name is Jumeir Haight. He's written, you get another manifesto, really neat one. Uh, it's called the New Capitalism Manifesto. <coughs> and really what it is, it's really capitalism with values. Okay? And it really speaks to a couple of things. First of all, he says, we have to look at people more than just consumers. We have to understand the difference between maximizing consumption and maximizing the quality of life. We don't want to sacrifice everything in the future for the present. We want to regard the planet as sacred. We want to narrow rather than exploit the inequalities in the world. Now, a lot of folks look at it and say, that's just a lot of compromise. But think about it. Is there anything in those statements that you don't like? That you wouldn't want? I, I don't think so. I don't think there's anything in those statements that suggest that we would not want to, uh, that we actually uh, let's continue sacrificing the future for the present. Or maybe we shouldn't narrow um, uh, the inequalities in the world. Look at the, it's, what we just talked about, the poverty and the outcomes and the world outcomes. And the things that are going on in the world right now, whether it be Egypt or other places, where people are tired of the inequalities. They're actually just tired of it. It's not right, it's not fair. But what is the role of something like capitalism? So when you look at a fellow like Amir, what he's talking about is saying, why do we pose this a little bit differently? As opposed to being uncreated, uninnovative, and not thinking about the sacred cow, let's not throw it all out, but can we actually take the things that are good and rethink it? Ask the question differently. <coughs> Instead of saying, you have to have, to have successful um, economics, you have to have haves and have nots. What if you don't have to have haves and have nots? What if you can actually say, we can actually protect the environment, create new products, reduce the inequality, and still create very successful growing businesses. What if that were the problem we're trying to solve? So when you look at all these issues, you look at these people who are actually looking at and actually beginning to challenge the sacred cows of design, of building, of manufacturing, of products, really starting to challenge the whole idea of what is business, what is capitalism. These are individuals that are using their creative mind. They're beginning to ask these questions and say, why can't we? So if we look at these new ideas, many new ideas, not just in the form of products, but the whole way in which we deal with products, the whole way we deal with societies, is what is creativity? What's its fundamental, uh, where does it come from? How do we actually grow and foster creativity? So if you buy the idea that creativity is a major, if not the major component, what really makes humans unique, our ability to think critically, critically Advanced. Uh, what is it that we need to do to ensure that we have lots of it that we actually capitalize on? Well, I always start, there's something we began with our, our, our collaborative groups. We said, you know, maybe if we start first and foremost, as what do we actually want? What's our aspiration? Would that actually guide us a little bit in terms of what creativity, what we want to create? 
create. And there's another fellow, uh, and again, I, just, I raise these individuals because there's just a plethora of information out there. We're not lacking in information. We're not lacking in knowledge. We're not lacking in science. We're lacking in will. We're lacking in creativity. We're lacking in connecting the dots to come up with better outcomes. And so one fellow who pulled it together, and he puts it in a, a framework of sustainability. And sustainability, not just environmental and energy, but sustainability of society. Sustainability in the context of everything that makes and allows the human race and all those around us to exist and continue. And he puts it in the form of a thing called community capital. I'm just going to read it directly. He says, a sustainable community uses its resources to meet current needs while ensuring that adequate resources are available for future generations. It seeks a better quality of life for all its residents while maintaining nature's ability to function over time by minimizing waste, preventing pollution, promoting efficiency, developing local resources to revitalize the local economy. Decision making in a sustainable community stems from a rich set of life and shared information among community members. A sustainable community resembles a living system in which human, natural, and economic elements are interdependent and draw strength from each other. Now, for a lot that would say, again, really that sounds like mother, but is there anything in that statement that you would want? Is there anything in that statement you'd say, Keep that part out because I got something better. I think that really, for me, kind of describes the world that I want to live in, the world that I want my children and also my grandchildren to live in, to inherit. And he goes on and he talks about in that overall community capital, there are things we have to focus on and worry about natural capital, human capital, social capital, cultural and physical and economic capital. It's not just about GDP, but nor is it just about. It's about what is the whole social, cultural, human infrastructure and capital and condition in, in, in our communities. So if this is something, if this is an aspiration, whatever aspiration we have, which I believe is the aspirations, these passions that drive the desire to create, what are the conditions for creativity? What are the conditions for these kinds of innovation? A uh, fellow Stephen Armstrong, he's written a really interesting book called Where Do Good Ideas? He talks about going back uh, decades, centuries actually, in terms of where some good ideas come from. And where he talked about was the great ideas come from originally, even before around the initiation of the printing press, were coffee houses. The way he talked about it, he said, you need to have places like coffee houses where ideas can get together and have sex. Right? Ideas get together to create more ideas. And he has a premise. His premise is that when you bring people together in groups, larger groups and larger groups again, that ideas don't grow linearly, they grow exponentially. He talks about this, this idea that how you create environments for creativity um, and what, the, what some signature behaviors of those kind of groups and those kind of environments look like. And it's something we believe actually in our own business is when we look at uh, creating opportunities and creating ideas and how you grow ideas. We used to think that you could actually define it Here. 
how we take these ideas forward, the environment, is absolutely critical. When we look at the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, this, this idea of the brain, how it comes together, how we put these things together, it starts talking about, in terms of our collaborations and such, is how do we get the right people in the room at the right time and begin to ask the right questions? It speaks to this whole idea of diversity. Diversity in race, creed, religion, ethnicity, but diversity in skills, sectors. You know, when we bring you know, these groups together, a lot of people together for the first time to talk about poverty, we have business folks, we have social folks, we have health folks, we have educational folks, we have government folks, in the room together, you start having these questions. You start talking about a thing called poverty. The first thing we typically hear is, gee, I didn't know that. The next thing we quite often hear next is that, is. Because there's so much we don't know ourselves. When we look at asking the right questions, it's that group that actually helps define what that may look like. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, a colleague of ours in Hamilton here, Paul Johnson, brought together a group of you know, former homeless shelters in Hamilton. This is about three or four years ago. And he brought them together because we were having this real issue, and we continue to have this issue, which is driven a lot by mental illness and a lot of other unfortunate health issues, and it's the lack of proper intervention. Now, we quite often label that as a poverty issue, but really it's a health issue, a health intervention issue, and it's a housing issue. But Paul brought the group together, and the group came together believing, with seeing where we were going with our economic at that point in time, economic at that point in time, and how bad we were getting worldwide, is that we better get ready for this onslaught or more homeless shelter bed and food. So by bringing these four groups together, we figured that together we become more efficient and more effective together to create those more beds, what they call hot meals and cots, um, than trying to do it alone. That was their idea. We came together and Paul began the entire discussion with this one question. Okay, folks, how do we put ourselves out of business? How do we put ourselves out of business? That question led that group in a completely different direction of thought, of creativity. Instead of saying, how do we grow our businesses, the right question to ask was, why do we have so many homeless people in the first place? And that we become not an emergency shelter, but instead, we have